Um, I'd like to start just by giving you an opportunity to talk about your organisations and your role within that, just as a bit of context as to why you're on the panel. So, Steve, do you want to start? Uh, well, yeah, um, my name's Steve Holmes. I'm the Chief Executive of Azuri Group, um, and we run, uh, have brands which you may have heard of, ZZ, Ask Italian, and also Coca de Mama. So we employ about 6,000, 6,500 people um, across the group, so we recruit quite a lot as well um, each year. And so um, um, upskilling our workforce and, um, and facing into some of the challenges that we've already talked about today is quite high up my uh, agenda. Quite up my, up my agenda, absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. Lee? Uh, yeah, so I look after training and stuff and things at um, Stonegate Group. So uh, we've got just a mere 4,500 businesses uh, across the UK. Uh, so you can imagine the... Uh, the breadth of L&D that we have uh, and people development uh, for age ranges, I suppose, that the typical age range from uh, 16 to 70s. And you also have a role on the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education. Yes, yeah, so it was interesting watching Robert earlier because I sit on uh, the root panel uh, for our industry. So the root panel is... I suppose it is, is the panel that look after the quality of our apprenticeships, what offer we have, um, and make sure that it suits employees, employers, uh, and the industry. Uh, and I, I think it's probably little known, the root, the root panel. So Robert talked about Trailblazers, which are the companies that trial and, uh, and improve the qualifications. And I think it's interesting wearing two hats, being... Uh, being a director in, in in quite a large business and then being uh, sitting on that uh, on that side with with iFate gives me an, uh, a unique I think insight into <coughs> qualifications we need and what we need to do with them. Brilliant. And Chris, what about your work at Springboard? So um, I run a hospitality charity called Springboards. And we're a slightly earlier piece in the in in the puzzle. We uh, promote the industry to the next generation and we give people the skills to launch their career. So we run employability training courses for unemployed people that give them the sort of soft skills, confidence, the hard skills, hospitals, you know, the basics, and then we help them find a brilliant job in the industry and pass them on to these guys to, to develop them from there. We also do a, a slightly earlier piece in, in schools and colleges. We um, have a big uh, cooking competition called Future Chef, had about 13,000 people go through that um, last year. We do things like careers road shows. I was over in Belfast yesterday and we had 70 students in the Crown Plaza showing them what a brilliant industry it is, cooking demos, making mocktails, having a tour, hearing quiz talks um, from the people who tell it best. Jeremy, last but certainly not least. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, <laughs> so HIT Training, we're a national training organisation. We do specialise in, in apprenticeships, about 3,500 apprentices at any one time on our programmes across multiple sectors, <coughs> although we do uh, I say specialise in hospitality catering, um, and such programmes as, as Brewer, with 400 odd colleagues uh, up and down the country, so ex-industry uh, professionals now you know, engaged in uh, teaching learning and the delivery of training to organisations large, um, sort of regional and, and SMEs within the uh, pub, bar, hotel, sort of hospitality space. Brilliant, thank you very much. So this panel is about um, delivering the future skills our sector needs. So all about education and training. So I thought it'd be fun to start by just giving our industry a grade on how we're doing that to start with. Are we A, B, C? I know it's one to five these days, but I'm 12 for that. So we'll go A, B, C, D. Um, and then I'll come back to you. If you just give me the grade, and then we'll talk a little bit later, come back to you on, on why you gave that grade. So uh, Steve, what grade would you give us when it comes to delivering future skills we need? Oof. Um, well, I think we do a better job than people think we do. So reputationally, a C. In practice, maybe C+. Plus. Lee? Um, I was thinking back to what grades I used to get, but we don't go that low. Um, <laughs> uh, I would probably say about a B-, minus, and I'd probably echo Steve. I, I, I listened to a couple of presentations earlier, and we talk about um, how the industry is perceived. I think we are shockingly bad at talking about the industry. Our, um, if, you, if, you read, if you read our trade press and our trade bodies every day, you'd think the industry is about to implode. And I think we've got to change the vernacular. We've got to change talking about the industry positively if we want other people to see it positively. So I suppose my answer is two-part. We've got to speak more positively. Uh, but I think we also need to tell people what we do. 
We had, we had over 4,000 people in formal training last year in a single business. You had, you had all the, some of the other big companies into that. You've had the whole in, industry into that. And we talk about that story and listening to the MP talk about our, our industry, what it does for the economy. I think we, we should talk about that more rather than talk ourselves down. So I'd say a B minus. I think we do better than, let's do so better than maybe we talk about. I'll be slightly more positive than these guys. I'll say a B, and I'll say there's people who are doing an absolutely brilliant job of it, and they're the, probably the type of organisations that are, would engage with an event like this. And you know, there's some really brilliant training programmes. I think there's things that could be slightly better, say, management training, some you know, developing the next level of, of, of managers that's probably come from a, quite a period of transition over the, the last few years. But then you could probably say, what, 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 do you, what do we mean by future skills? And Steve and I were just talking to the minister out there and saying that actually hospitality is brilliant for giving people life skills that you could take into transfer into any, any, um, any job, any industry. That, you know, Steve was talking about the confidence it's given his daughter, but things like negotiation and, and leadership skills and, and you know, we're talking about problem solving or, or, or dealing, with, dealing with challenging situations and taking autonomy and... and I think that's a, that's a really big part of the skills that hospitality does deliver. Jeremy. Yeah, I think historically uh, a C plus with a strap line from the tutor saying could do better. Um, more recently, though, I think we're in the in the realms of B. From an educational point of view, I think um, it's it's always been a challenge. I think with with how um, the moving feast that is hospitality and how adaptable it has been to various. Um, economic disasters, downturns and the like, and I think the hospitality is, is great at sort of regenerating itself. I think educationally, with programmes and content, we're always about six months behind delivering what the industry wants, although I would suggest recently, and why the positive B, is that you know, what we are doing as providers is spending a lot more time with employers you know, in their environment and understanding from their point of view exactly you know, what are the new trends, what are the new um, sort of skill requirements, and we are able to quickly, you know, adopt and include that in our programmes as we deliver. But I think there's a lot more we can be doing. I think it will be a long while before we hit an A, I'm afraid. I think it's going to be a while yet. Room for improvement then. But, and sticking with you, Jeremy, this is about future skills. So how are we doing? Where can we improve on delivering, looking forward and delivering now what we're going to need in several years' time down the line? Well, I, th I think it's, it's all around communication. I mean, it's, it's about sort of taking, you know, ourselves out of our own little um, sort of mi uh, micro space from, you know, an educational point of view and spending time in industry and really understanding what the, the customer demands, what the guest requires, um, you know, understanding the, the sort of shortfall on, on personnel, staff shortfalls, but being able to try and adapt and be flexible with our delivery model and how we can ensure to sort of keep it, keep it ever present. Great example is the brewer program we do. I mean, the, the sort of, the massive sort of upsurge of craft breweries and small micro breweries, you know, has, has brought about various different sort of flavor techniques, flavor styles, characteristics. Uh, and, you know, I have to spend a lot of time in pubs and breweries, I'm afraid, and that's just an occupational hazard that I'll, I'll have to learn to live with. But I think that enables us to keep up to speed with, you know, with what is required. Um, as far as future trends in um, sort of in service style, I don't think there's, there's there's too much different. I think customers are now looking for that that experience, you know. Um, and a lot is said around value for money and you know offer of food and service and accommodation. But I think you know I think what we are experiencing is the customer just wants a, a blooming good experience, you know. Uh, they want value for money, of course. Um, they are price sensitive, yes, but I think it's the experience that really needs to be challenged. And as such, in every hospitality programme that's delivered, that sort of customer communication, customer service, customer skill is imperative. Whether you're working in a kitchen, you know, on the pass, you know, as a, in reception, housekeeping, or, you know, on the floor, um, we all should have that, that skill and, and enhance that skills to be able to engage with customers. Customers are whom are either internal to the business or external as guests and clients. What about some of the softer skills we talk about? Things like mental health and well-being, which every industry is talking about, but particularly has become a hot topic in hospitality. Steve, can you talk about a bit how about how you're approaching that in terms of training and upskilling people in, in those areas? Um, well, I think what's first and foremost, like hospitality is kind of the original 
um, hospitable sector. By its nature, what we aspire to deliver to our customers every day is, is uh, as, as you're saying, is we, we're, we're here to, to sort of deliver great times to people. Our job is to make people happy. Um, and therefore, I think that we are innately a, a supportive and um, flexible uh, employer and sector, and that leads well into uh, um, how we support people through uh, flexible careers, but also in um, uh, sort of addressing some of their uh, sort of well-being needs. Um, we don't have a good reputation for it, I think, uh, to pick up what Lee was saying. I think we have this reputation that we're hard-working, exploitative, low-pay, uh, unsocial, but actually there's a good, good group of people who, who want to um, to join the industry because of its flexible nature and more hands-on, and I think we should be championing that. And I think that, that um, um, as, as a result, you don't have to force people into a sort of, you know, against their wishes into a, a sector whereby they might be nine to five with, uh, and that has a sort of detrimental effect on people's lives. And, and so embracing our flexibility and our hospitable nature, I think, can to feed into, in, to feed into um, you know, people's well-being and, and, and employees in this sector. Lee, is that something you've been looking at Stonegate as well, such a huge workforce? Yeah, I think the, the, the pandemic had some uh, positive or intended benefits, but I think that, that it, no, without doubt, had an effect on people's well-being. So we'd been looking at uh, what we do in that area before the pandemic and actually post-pandemic we binned what we were doing and started again. Um, and we have been working in three areas of wellbeing, not just mental wellbeing, but physical and financial. Um, so we've, we've launched a portal that focuses on that. Um, and there's lots of, of help. And we're just, we're just engaging with Burnt Chef, which is interesting. What we've also done, though, is developed the workshop we were running. Just It, try, it was trying to bore the ocean. And, and really what you want to try and do is signpost, because... Uh, as our CEO says, if, if someone's got a bad back, they don't come to you and say, can, I fi can you fix my bad back? So signposting to experts. But a new programme we've developed around developing resilience gives people the background as to what's happening, chemically, emotionally, but then the, the workshop twists and says, right, what are you going to do about it? And gives them tools and help. And I think that's one of the things we've maybe got to uh, change our focus on and say, actually, you're going to help yourself out of this. And we'll give you the tools and we'll support you and we'll help yourselves out of it. And I think that the second bit I'd say is, uh, to Steve's point, around the hours uh, that people do. I always find it strange how, uh, maybe because of my age, but in our nightclubs, we've got circa 100 nightclubs. I find it astounding people want to work till that time in the morning. And they want to work at a party. If they can't be at the party, they want to work getting paid to be at the party. So I think dialing into the motivations that people have, uh, have got for things so... Uh, I think that's an interesting one because people come to work for us because they're part of having a good time. And as Steve said, hopefully our businesses, we leave people feeling better when, when they arrived. And that's, if you can't have a good time in our industry, you may as well give up. And given the unique state of hospitality, are the qualifications and schemes we have open to us at the moment fit for our sector or do we need to work on that? Chris, do you want to pick up on that a bit? Um, it, it's definitely an ongoing challenge and I know, you know, Sandra and 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 Susie here are leading a sort of a, a big review of that as part of the sort of the hospitality apprenticeship steering group. I know there's there's uh, a, lot, a lot of work organisations like Lee's with IFATE um, are, are certainly feeding into that. And you know, only only last week I heard about the Institute for Apprenticeships um, re reviewing the the different the different um, apprenticeship options and probably. Uh, not in a good way um, for, for what the industry uh, needs. And what does the industry need more of, or en anyone, open to anyone? I, I think it just it perhaps needs demystifying a little bit from a qualification point of view. I think there's so many various <coughs> pathways one can follow uh, through you know, online compliance, short shop, you know, interactive skills workshops to uh, qualifications and apprenticeships. And you know, I think we spend a lot of time trying to explain the, the difference between the various options available for not just learners, but for you know parents of learners and for employers, mm -hmm. and that you know that needs a bit of help and it needs a bit of simplification because you know when an individual can see a clear progressive, I mean I love what Leanne said earlier on, skills are the new pension. 
but we need to be able to sort of demonstrate in quick time um, you know, to those interested parties what routes that they can take and, and what opportunities you know, are going to be fulfilled aligned to that particular route. Um, so I think we, we have a, a plethora of qualifications, programmes, courses and apprenticeships. Yeah, some need review, and I think the, the apprenticeships perhaps need a, another look. Um, don't deny that. But I think we need to be a little more, um, uh, sort of, we need more clarity explaining what the programmes are, how they're undertaken, <coughs> what, they, what the benefits, not only to the individual, to the recipient, to the apprentice, but also primarily to the business. I mean, that's the conversation we had. And the first question that perhaps if they don't ask me would, would normally be what's in it what's in it for me, what's in it for the business. And I think that's, that's one we've got to be mindful of. And perhaps a bigger challenge is communicating it out to the, the, the advisors, the parents, the careers, you know, the teachers, the careers advisors who probably aren't recommending apprenticeships and certainly hospitality apprenticeships enough as a, as a brilliant career prospect. I think they need to be modernised because, you know, talking about T-levels, I'm not as close to it as you, but our guys in, uh, are, are telling me that, you know, they're still thinking about that the professional cookery T-level is still thinking about professional kitchens filleting fish. Yeah. Now, I'm one of these weirdos that, were, that wanted to get into hospitality 30 years ago. And I remember having a conversation with my father, who was a professional working in the city of London, that there was absolutely no way that my son's going to be a cook. It's not, it's not going to happen. And so the compromise was I had to do a sort of hospitality business management degree with, 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 with catering. Um, but as, as it happens, and, and on that course, I learned to bone a joint, fillet a fish. I've never filleted a fish since. So, and my frustration is that we have not adapted our skills and our courses, even in 30 years, to sort of reflect the, the modernity of the industry these days, where you have exposure to hospitality, to marketing, to property, to HR, to you know, finance, accounting, technology, IT, et cetera. It's so broad and diverse. And then we talked to, Chris was mentioning earlier about the leadership skills that you develop. You develop um, tremendous leadership capabilities and those human skills and social skills at a very, very young age where people in our restaurants at you know, early 20s are managing a team of 20 or 30 people. And that's unrecognised, but that's a tremendous skill because you know, we hire people from professional services in their 30s that haven't got the people skills that people in restaurants have developed 10 years earlier. So I think helping um, to make sure that our, um, the courses that we are developing and, um, and working with, with, with government around T-levels and, and the apprenticeships are reflecting the breadth and the, and the need and then selling that to the wider public so that people like my father don't, don't frown on people wanting to join hospitality but encourage their children to join hospitality. Although, Steve, if you're honest, I think you told me you wanted to join hospitality because you didn't want to start work before 11 a.m., well, that's, well, I mean, that's not split hairs, but, I, um, but, I, but you're right. I, I didn't want to get up at, at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning. I, I wanted to be working in the evening, and what better industry to do it when I could be social and be paid to be having fun, working um, with other people, making people happy. It was sort of like the ultimate um, um, job, job for me, and, um, um, and, it, and you know, I managed to work my way through... Um, through the ranks, I guess, from a career perspective. So it can be incredibly fulfilling and enriching as well, uh, as, well as um, professionally um, challenging. So, uh, uh, and I think our, bi our biggest challenge is to change the narrative and make sure that this is seen as an industry. Um, who was talking to, uh, we were just talking earlier as well, weren't we, to the minister, and, and someone was saying that you know, people going to talk to colleges and, uh, and, you know, should we go and talk about hospitality and talk about, as, as a career, and it's like, no, 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 we haven't really got a place for you in hospitality. We want to talk to PwC or we want to talk to the professional. And that's, that, that we have to change that because that is sort of so deeply wrong on so many levels that, that the third biggest employer in the UK can't get airtime in colleges and universities to champion this industry as a, as a sector. And so um, um, I think that's what we've got to try really hard to, to, to do. But it doesn't help when qualifications are talking about filleting fish. Yeah. And I think that, back to your, your question earlier on, Robin, about are the qualifications we've got fit for purpose? And I, I think what, what we're having to do is not necessarily review every single qualification every, t every single moment, but it's, it's ensuring that the delivery of that said standard or that apprenticeship is adaptable enough to, to, to sort of cover the areas that, that A, the, the client, the customer needs and wants, or what the industry basically needs. So there's an awful lot of enrichment, added value elements that are delivered, you know, as, alongside that apprenticeship standard that is kind of set and, and it's like turning a juggernaut to, 
to amend those. I know Sandra and Co are you know, doing the, the, the damnedest to make that happen. But in the meantime, we just have to you know, absolutely convince employers and people entering the, the industry that you know, we understand what the industry needs, we understand that there are standards that we're obliged to deliver, but aside of that, or in addition to that, is the added value elements that really brings the programme to life. And Lee, at Stonegate, you've done sort of bespoke apprenticeships and created mm. bespoke training programmes. Do you want to talk a bit about why you took that approach and the kind of process of that? Well, I think it goes, goes, back, to, goes back to standards and frameworks. And uh, Look, we... we um, our industry does, doesn't play well together. And actually, I quite like the fact that doesn't because that creates the point of difference uh, on certain elements. Um, and one of the things in the early days, I mean, Stonegate's only 12 years old, and one of the things we did was want to centre on our strategy on people development. So we created our, we created our career pathway that people go through at a serious pace. This, this developed people, but it was also something we needed. We were buying and buying and buying. We were quite an acquisitive company. We were buying business and we needed to create GMs um, and all other roles. So, we, so our career pathway, it's a well-known story with most people. We, we centre it on Albert Einstein as a figurehead and a, bit, a little bit tongue-in-cheek. And we have uh, two career pathways, one for ops and one for our head office team. Uh, and they work through those qualifications. What we've also then done is we've got an internal qualification, uh, sorry, internal uh, career pathway, but they can also do it through a qualification. So each, each level has the apprenticeship uh, version. But the problem is they're time bound. So one of my issues, and it always has been with, the, with apprenticeships, is the minimum time is 12 months. Well, a barista qualification, I don't care what Starbucks costs to tell me, it doesn't take 12 months to train it. And they, they don't think that either. But actually, that's how long the qualification has to be. So I think one of the problems is that work-based qualifications are maybe not as flexible as they need to be. So we have uh, concurrent programmes where a deputy manager can do our internal programme at half the time but not get a qualification or, or, or an apprenticeship. And that's worked really well because the results pretty much give us the same, uh, the same results. And I, I suppose what I'd, I'd add to that is then what we can do is tell the story. So I'm a little bit close to this. I'm, this is fascinating for me, but my son has got one of our pubs. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, and he runs a business, first business, doing a million pounds a year with a team of about 20. He's now been asked to look at a pub, the next pub to look at, and it's going to be a £40,000 a week. So a £2 million a year business with a team of 40 at 22 years old. Where else, where, what other industry can you do that? Um, so, uh, and what we found is, looking at some of the figures, and we're venture capitalists owned, so we have to prove this works. And what we found is our internal people coming through um, it halves the turnover every level they move up. So we see a, 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 a turnover half at team leader, deputy, and GM. And we see them about 8% more profitable than externals. So when I, when I was listening earlier about um, a recruitment problem, and I'm uh, probably going to upset some people here, I, I don't, I, we haven't got a recruitment problem. We've got a retention problem as an industry. Um, because I'm talking to my, I'm talking to GMs, and I can't talk for everybody. And I know that London is slightly different, and London's the centre of the world. But um, outside of London, there isn't a recruitment problem. We've got a retention problem. So your question about why do we do our own programmes and drive it so much is, is actually to retain. Retain, and we turn, we return about one, eight pounds to every pound we spend on L and D. Um, and that, and that, by the way, I haven't worked that out. Our owners, who are ex City bankers, have worked that out. And I use that every time it comes to my appraisal, every year with a CEO to justify why I should stay in my job. But yeah, so, uh, so it works for the business, it, it works for the individuals, then moving through, but it, it also aids retention and actually is more profitable for us. So that's why we did it. And can we talk a bit about the benefits of things like apprenticeships to employers, particularly for SMEs who are looking at apprenticeships and it's, it's a lot of time and investment and money. I mean, Jeremy talked about this before. What are the clear benefits that you persuade employers to invest in this sort of thing? I mean, as far as SME, that's, you know, that's a, another nut that is, is a little more difficult to crack because you know, they, they do need some convincing. I mean, we will, we will always look at um, sort of key metrics, key business metrics primarily, and uh, with the confidence of being able to sort of go back into the business six months after starting a program and being able to prove to the, you know, the, the business owner or the operator the impact that sort of teaching and learning or a, a training strategy has, has had. Um, 
I, I'll normally talk about four, four key measures, recruitment and retention being one, absolutely, and retention being the, the sort of key, the key piece at the moment. Everybody wants to keep the people they've got um, as, as, as close to the business as possible. The, the next one, which is, uh, that's easily measured through wage percentages and you know, sort of recruitment uh, strategies. Customer satisfaction is one I will always use as well. Um, a number of organisations, whether they have mystery customers or, or you know, sort of track their sort of customer feedback, that's, that's a measure that sort of six, nine months into a, a training strategy should have improved. Invariably does. I've, I'm yet to find a business where it hasn't improved. You know, training might be around uh, product knowledge, customer interaction skills, communication. It might be fish filleting, for example, uh, Steve. It could be it could be you know salt and pepper cleaning, as we've heard earlier on. You know, to get a nice clean condiment set. Um, it could be all sorts, and that will naturally improve customer satisfaction scores. And then thereafter. Uh, productivity and profitability are the questions that an operator, I, mean, I was a publican for years myself, you know, and if people talk to me in that sort of language, then I'm going to sort of sit and listen as to what the solution might be. So it's, it's being confident in the products you deliver from an educational point of view, it's being confident in the programmes you deliver are going to have a tangible and measurable impact, not only on the individual undertaking the, the programmes, but on the business and where they work. That's, that would that would en ensure an SME conversation continues longer than five minutes. And what about moving away from apprenticeships? What about T levels? Are they going to help plug some of these gaps, Steve? Uh, well, I hope so. I mean, I, I make the point about T levels as well in the, the breadth of them, and they're still, they're still thinking like... Um, the, the, Filleting fish. Filleting fish, yeah. <laughs> um, we've probably overused that one now. But... Um, I think they will help because it's another qualification that's at a level level. I think again, I'm not the expert, but I think it's a, a, you know it's at that level which I think gives people another option. Um, we're certainly getting involved with colleges now and doing webinars um, with those guys to start to offer the sort of employment that sits alongside their studies at, at, at T level, um, and I think I think that can only help. Um, so we're very supportive of that. Um, but I also think internships and other things as well, because we I've talked about the breadth, but we, we work with um, uh, Salta, which is a sort of Scottish uh, charity um, on internships, and, as well as a number of others, and offer internships in our office. So for people wanting to study um, digital IT, accounting, uh, finance, property, even, et cetera. Um, and we've actually managed, we have a tremendous... Um, success rate of people coming in doing internships from you know so these are post grad internships so they got you know good university degrees in whatever uh, topic they, they they choose and they don't really consider hospitality as a career and we get them into to the office and they learn they do an internship and we've managed I think we've hired nearly 50 percent of the interns that we've taken over the last five or six years um, who've never considered a professional a career in hospitality in marketing. So these people aren't necessarily in the restaurants. But again, it talks to the breadth of hospitality as, a, as, a, as an industry, which is much greater than just sort of uh, in the restaurants themselves. So like, all, all those things, I think, can, can only help. I think the, 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 the challenges with T-levels, uh, I suppose the benefits are we are last to go. Soapbox, what a surprise. Um, so it doesn't start from next year. It's only back of house. And to take Steve's point, it's only really focused on classical, what I would call class. When I was younger, 7061, 7062, 7063. It, yeah. Professional it's cookery, still, isn't it? It's still yeah. based on, on that. And my favourite line is, they teach a soul bomb femme. Nobody's at a soul bomb femme for 30 years, but, uh, but they still teach it. So I think there's some work for the industry to do with high field who are developing the qualification um, to make sure that it's fit for purpose. I still am slightly frustrated there isn't a front of house to level, although I do understand why, because if you were doing a front of house, I was originally told it's because it's not, not a skilled front of house, and those of those of in the audience from a pub background, if you try and tell someone's not a technical skill in running a pub, then it's a difficult conversation. But I do get the challenge that actually for them to do a front of house, you'd be looking at them running a pub at 18 and 19, which isn't going to happen. Um, so I think... I think it's early days yet on T-Level. We're, we're seeing uh, what Highfield... Uh, 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 we've fed back a few times Highfield on things that need changing in the qualification. Um, and it, it, it still you know, it doesn't start till, uh, till mid-24. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, and then, to Chris's point, it's then how do you market it to, yeah. uh, 
to, uh, to parents. Um, I, I, on the route panel, we've got a lecturer and the, um, the head of the Chef's Guild, and they've been asking students what they see of hospitality. In the top three answers collated, they don't understand that pubs, bars, restaurants, hotels is what hospitality is. We've, we've got a problem with what we call hospitality. So I think we've got some serious work to do there. By the way, I don't have a solution what we call hospitality, but, but the youngsters don't, don't understand what hospitality is. That, that's not a word they, they use in their vernacular. And um, talking about outreach, Chris, I just want to come to you about this. I know you do some good stuff. Looking at over 50s, refugees, other markets, can you talk a bit about your kind of work there and their reaction to hospitality? Yeah, so we, we support... Um, through our training courses, we support anyone who is unemployed and probably has a few barriers that are preventing them finding a, a, that, that work on their own. And it could be, traditionally, it's been for a, a very high percentage under 30. Um, we found in the last couple of years there's quite a lot of support for that, that, that age group. But when about 80% of our trainees are coming through the job centres. And when we're going into job centres, we're seeing more and more 50-plus who are looking for support and there wasn't really the support for them. So we've, we've, we've certainly sort of been working with more and more of, of those groups. Um, they could be anything from they might have been out of work for a few years while they've been raising a family and, and are lacking a bit of confidence. They could be refugees who have come from a, you know, had a, had a brilliant career, but in a different country and are coming over and have no network, have no support around them, have, aren't aware of the, 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 diff the different sectors and customs. Um, and so, yeah, we've... That we, we, we have been offering sort of three week courses for, for all, all these sorts of different groups um, and yeah, had, had really good success rates. Um, to, to the last point, we can't just, well, a big part of our courses is promoting hospitality and we can't do that in a classroom. You can't show people this is a hotel, getting out and showing people the industry, taking them on a tour of a, a brilliant hotel or a great cocktail bar or a fantastic private members club that people just hadn't really hadn't really thought of is so inspirational or so much more inspirational than um doing it through words or pictures but also you see all the great roles that that, that exist within the industry and for example we had one of our we were running a course in birmingham recently and one of our trainees we took him to a, a hilton hotel and they got they had a tour from the general manager who's one of our ambassadors they showed them all the different departments and he said, oh, I want to work in hotel maintenance. That's the one for me. I'm from a logistics background, I love the idea of this, this part of the hotel you just didn't know exist as a customer, but it's so critical to, 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 to the running of the organisation with a very specific skill set, which worked for him. And it, 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 serving customers is a big part of hospitality. Cooking food is a big part of hospitality. But there's sales and marketing and, and events and digital and tech and HR and maintenance which <laughs> don't know exists and such a key part of, of what we do brilliant on that positive note we have unfortunately run out of time and um, thank you so much for your time today i'm going to give us all an a plus as a panel today well, yeah, so well done good. us thank you very much thanks very much